Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Let me say uh, it's a pleasure to be here at NYU. I've been here uh, fairly frequently before, and it's a pleasure each time, so it's a pleasure this time too. Um, now, I'm a philosopher, and um, my guess is not nearly all of you are either philosophers or majoring in philosophy. I mean, <clears throat> that's a sad truth about the world, but that's the way it is. Um, and, I'm, and what I'm going to talk about here for a half hour or so is philosophy. And I have to admit philosophy has sort of a, oh, how shall I put it, a bad press in the world these days. And, uh, and perhaps with some reason, actually, because when you, um, when you think about philosophy, when you do philosophy, you have to think about some kind of miserable, unpleasant situations. So, for example... Uh, there's the idea of being a brain in a vat, you know. You imagine that you are captured by aliens, transported to their planet somewhere a long ways from here. They remove your brain from your skull, keep it artificially alive in a vat of nutrients, attach electrodes to various parts of it, and the other end to their Apple computer, and then they type in what it is they want you to think and feel and believe. Well, I mean, if that were to happen, everything would seem to you just the way it does seem, right? So how do you know that's not the case? How do you know you're not a brain in a vat? That's a kind of miserable thing to think about. That's a miserable scenario. Another scenario is that of, um, if, you, if you're a philosopher, you have to think about solipsism. Uh, a solipsist is somebody who thinks that he or she is the only thing that exists, everything else being a figment of their imagination, right? So if you're a solipsist, you think that you alone exist and um, everything else is a figment of your imagination. Now, there have been some solipsists. For example, the philosopher Bertrand Russell was a solipsist for a while. Of course, for most anything you pick out, Bertrand Russell was it for a while. So um, that's not so surprising. Um, according to his report, he once got a letter from a woman, I think Lady Ladd Franklin was her name, and uh, she said something like this. She said she had read what he wrote, Russell had written about solipsism, and she found it really convincing. She thought, that's right, solipsism is right. And she said, I wonder why there aren't more of us. <laughs> which, uh, which is uh, a little paradoxical, maybe. When I was uh, just starting off in philosophy many years ago, at Wayne State University in Detroit, I heard that there was a real live solipsist there, a professor in the, uh, in the medical school. So I decided I wanted to see what a solipsist looked like, you know, how they would behave and so on, what their reaction would be to me, who would be for them just a figment of their imagination and the like. So I went to see this professor in the medical school and we had a friendly, reasonably friendly chat, you know, a satisfactory chat. He treated me pretty well for a mere figment. <laughs> um, so then finally it became time to leave, so I set out to leave, you know, and one of his younger colleagues took me aside and said, you know, we take very good care of Dr. So-and-so because when he goes, we all go. <laughs> so, so that's solipsism. Now, I'm not going to talk about solipsism at all. I'm going to talk about something quite different, namely the relation between science and religion. A lot of people think there is conflict between science and religion, that somehow the two are opposed to each other, or that if you're really serious about science, you can't also be really serious about religion. Um, and, and there are several different areas, or loci, as you might call them, where these conflicts are supposed to arise. One would be that between, say, miracles and science. So Christians believe in miracles. They believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that Jesus turned water into wine, walked on water, and so on. Um, 
Many Christians believe there are miracles that happen nowadays too, and the same goes for other religions. And many people think that there's a conflict between the idea that miracles do in fact happen on the one hand and what science teaches, that there are these laws and so on on the other, because the thought is that if there are miracles, they go contrary to natural law. They break these, break in quotes, these natural laws which are promulgated by science, so there's conflict. I'm not gonna talk about that. But I don't think there is any conflict there, but that's one alleged area. Another would be um, scientific scripture scholarship. So the thought is if you look at scripture in a scientific way, study it as a scientific object, you wind up with, uh, you wind up with ideas as to what it reports quite different from those that are held by people who take the Bible seriously as God's word, for example. And there are others as well, but I'm gonna talk just about one area uh, where there is alleged to be conflict, and that would be evolution, evolutionary theory. Many people think there is a conflict between evolution on the one hand and religious belief, Christian belief, belief in God on the other hand. Some of these people are, you might say, well to the right. They think uh, they, they are serious evangelical, maybe fundamentalist Christians. They think there's a conflict there. Others are well to the left, scientists of various kinds and others, philosophers, Richard Dawkins, for example, and, uh, and various others, Daniel Dennett. And they claim, they, they say that there's a conflict here. And I wanna begin just by talking briefly about that. Now, the first thing to note is that evolution um, covers a variety, covers a wide variety of, according to the New Testament, um, grace covers a wide variety of sins. According to me, the term evolution covers a wide variety of theses, not necessarily sinful theses, just theses. So for example, the ancient earth thesis, the idea that the world is very old, not merely <clears throat> 5,000 years, not 10,000 years, but maybe 4 billion, maybe even older than that. And second, there's a thesis of descent with modification. The idea that all of the uh, enormous variety we find in the living room, uh, living world, <laughs> some, sometimes in your living room too, but but I'm thinking about the living world, all the enormous variety you find of different kinds of plants and different kinds of animals and so on, all comes to be by virtue of offspring differing, usually in relatively smallish ways, from their parents. Um, the next thesis would be the common ancestry thesis connected with the previous one, namely that if you pick any two living creatures, and trace their ancestry back far enough, you'll come upon a common ancestor, right? So we are all cousins. We human beings are all cousins of each other, but well beyond that, we're really cousins of uh, all the other kinds of animals as well as, as well as plant life too. So you and the poison ivy in your backyard are really cousins, maybe distant cousins, and maybe in the case of some people it's easier to see than in others, but nonetheless, cousins, all right? And then finally, the fourth thesis is what we could, could call Darwinism, which is the thought that the main uh, mechanism driving this process of descent with modification is something like natural selection. I'm sure you've all heard of natural selection. Working on some form of genetic variation, the most common candidate being random genetic mutation. All right, so by virtue of natural selection, working on genetic variation, that you wind up with all the vast variety that there is in the living world. Well now, um, let's ask whether this is incompatible with Christian or theistic belief, belief in God, all right? Um, when I speak of Christian belief, I'm thinking of what you might call, what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity. What, what, sort, what you might think of as in common to all the great Christian creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the, uh, the Catholic Baltimore Confession, 
um, the Heidelberg Catechism from the Reform side of things, and the like. Uh, roughly speaking, the intersection of these creeds would be mere Christianity. And when I think of theism, I'm thinking of, of the theistic religions. I'm thinking of Christianity and Islam and Judaism, all of which unite in supposing that there is this being, God, who is the creator of the world, is a person, is um, unlimited in power, in knowledge, and in love, all right? So if you ask yourself, with respect to these four theses, is evolution, in, is, um, say, um, mere Christianity incompatible with the ancient Earth thesis? Well, presumably not. Some Christians think the world is very young, but that's not part of mere Christianity. That would be in addition to mere Christianity. As far as mere Christianity goes, the Earth could be very old, just as it is, in fact, asserted to be by scientists. Well, what about the thesis of descent with modification? Now, theists believe that God has created the world, but he could have done so by means of some process of descent with modification. Again, there's no conflict between that and Christian belief, mere Christianity just as such. And the same would go for the common ancestry thesis. Maybe that's how, how God did things, how he created the living world. And, but what about Darwinism? The idea that what drives the whole, this whole process, what drives the whole thing is this mechanism of natural selection working on some form of genetic variation, say random genetic variation, uh, random genetic mutations of one kind or another. Well, there too, there's, there's no obvious conflict uh, because God could, if he wanted to, he could have done things by, I don't say he did things this way, maybe it's not even plausible to think that he did things this way, but he certainly could have um, brought it about that we have the kinds of life we have by virtue of such a process. In fact, as far as that goes, God could create, he could create um, the genetic mutations involved so he gets the right ones at the right time so he could guide the whole process in the direction he wants it to go. As far as I can see, there's no conflict there either. Where there is conflict is between Christianity or the theistic religions generally, between Christianity and the thought that evolution, that we have come to be here by way of evolution and that evolution is unguided, unguided, undirected, unplanned, purposeless, uh, words of that sort. If evolution is unguided, and we have come to be by virtue of evolution, then it wouldn't be correct, wouldn't be right to say that God has, for example, created us, created human beings in his image, as both Christians and Jews and some Muslims assert. If God has created us in his image, what that means is he had a certain thing in mind. He wanted us to be a certain way. And then however he accomplished the creation, he did it in such a way as to accomplish uh, bring about that particular end, that there be creatures of that sort. And of course that involves guiding and planning and orchestrating. So I say there is, there is no conflict between um, evolution just as such and the theistic religions, Christianity, mere Christianity. No conflict there. Where there is conflict is between Christianity and the thought that evolution is unguided. That's where there is conflict. Conflict between the thought that evolution is unguided on the one hand, and on the other hand, the idea that God has created us human beings in his image, all right? Nevertheless, though, there are a whole lot of, there's a whole choir of distinguished experts who assert exactly that, that evolution is unguided is unplanned, unorchestrated by God or by anyone else. So for example, here's George Gaylord Simpson. He says, man, um, and I would add in parentheses, no doubt woman as well, man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. I suppose in principle you could say that's true for man and not for woman but it would be a sort of unusual view, right? To think that man is a, 
process of some purposeless uh, natural process, but woman isn't. Well, I don't want to discuss that much further. That could, that could lead to a dangerous territory. Then there is Stephen Jay Gould who says, if the evolutionary tape were to be wound, rewound and then let go forward again, the chances are we'd get creatures of very different sorts. All right, and the chances that are that we probably wouldn't get anything like Homo sapiens, so he thinks. And here's a particularly eloquent statement of this thesis by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Blind, uh, the God, sorry, The Blind Watchmaker. Now, Richard Dawkins has been in the news lately, along with others of the uh, <coughs> so-called new atheist or the four horsemen of atheism, not the four horsemen of the apocalypse, not even the four horsemen of Notre Dame, but the four horsemen of atheism. And one of these four horsemen is uh, Dawkins. This book of his, The Blind Watchmaker, I think is a very good book. Um, he's written a more recent book called The God Delusion, which I think is a very bad book, more like an ignorant screed than a real contribution to uh, any particular discussion or discipline. But The Blind Watchmaker is a good book. And here's what he says. Um, in the, he says, early on in the book, he says, all appearances to the contrary, the only watchmaker in nature is the blind forces of physics, albeit deployed in a very special way. A true watchmaker has foresight. He designs his cogs and springs and plans their interconnections with a future purpose in his mind's eye. Natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life has no purpose in mind. It has no mind and has no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. If it can be said to play the role of watchmaker in nature, it is the blind watchmaker. All right, that's the blind, natural selection is the blind watchmaker. And the subtitle of his book, of this book is, now the very subtitle, Why the Evidence of Evolution Reveals a Universe Without Design. All right. Now why does Dawkins think that natural selection is blind and unguided? Why does he think that the evidence of evolution reveals a universe without design? Um, well, in this book, he really does three things. First, he recounts some of the fascinating anatomical details of certain living creatures and of their behavior. So, for example, he talks about uh, bats. How the, and, and when he does this, he's very good. He's very good in explaining and exploring and describing the natural world. He talks about bats and how they can fly through a completely darkened cave, uh, no light at all, with stalactites hanging from the ceiling and stalagmites rising from the floor, or maybe it's the other way around, but whatever, <laughs> can fly through at an enormous rate of speed and not so much as brush any of them. By virtue of their, uh, they have a kind of sonar, right? The bats send out uh, little squeaky sounds and receive these sounds, bounce off various objects that come back. By virtue of them, the bat can do this kind of navigation. Secondly, he, um, he tries to refute arguments for the idea that blind, unguided evolution could not have produced some of the wonders of the living world. So going all the way back to Darwin's time, there were people, St. George Mavart, for example, who said, well, there are certain things, certain kinds of features of animals, certain kinds of organs um, that just could not have come about by virtue of blind, unguided evolution. The eye was a, uh, was a kind of favorite example. Well, Dawkins does what he can to try to refute these arguments. And third, he makes suggestions as to how these the ones like eyes and so on, and other organic systems could have developed by way of unguided evolution, all right? The form of his main argument, though, here's the form of the main argument. 
i.e. the argument for the conclusion that evolution reveals a universe without design. All right. Now, if I could, I'd write this down on a blackboard, but despite our being extremely high tech, we don't have a blackboard. So, so, um, so pay very careful attention. Okay. The premise then is an argument that has one has a premise and a conclusion. The premise is we know of no irrefutable objections to its being biologically possible that all of life has come to be by way of unguided. Darwinian processes, all right? We know of no irrefutable objections to its being biologically possible that all of life has come to be by way of unguided evolution. That's the premise. The conclusion is all of life has come to be by way of unguided Darwinian processes. As far as I can make out, that's the form of his main argument I mean, that is the form of the argument for the conclusion that evolution reveals a universe without design. The argument really is it's possible, so it must have happened. Or nobody has proved it to be impossible, therefore it happened. Okay? Now, uh, philosophers sometimes give uncogent arguments, and I must confess I've done the same thing myself on occasion. But they hardly ever come up with arguments that are as sort of wildly uncogent as that argument. I mean, the argument is, it's possible that this happened, therefore it did happen. Imagine if I come home and tell my wife that, um, uh, tell my wife that President Obama has decided there is to be a new medal for philosophy struck, and I'm to be the first recipient. Well, she says, um, what makes you think that? And I say, nobody's proved it impossible. <laughs> Not a good argument, right? As far as, I, as far as I can see, that's the only argument there is in that book for the conclusion that all of life has come to be by way of unguided Darwinian processes or that the evidence of evolution reveals a universe without design. Okay, that's the first part of what I want to say. Um, now I want to go further, and I want to argue that there is a real, um, how can I put this, a real tension between evolution, the scientific theory of evolution on the one hand, and um, naturalism on the other. Where here I take naturalism to be the idea that there is no such person as God or anything like God, all right? Dawkins would be a naturalist. Daniel Dennett would be a naturalist. Uh, lots and lots of other philosophers nowadays are naturalists. Uh, some people say that naturalism is the orthodoxy of the academy, and um, that might be right. Um, in any event, that's what naturalism is, the idea that there's no such person as God or anything like God. So naturalism is stronger than atheism. You could be an atheist without being a naturalist, if, for example, you thought there was something a lot like God, but distinct from God, Plato's ideas, for example, or the Stoics' news, or something like that, you could be a, an atheist without rising to the full heights of naturalism, but you couldn't be a naturalist without being an atheist, okay? Now, what I want to argue is that, there, that you can't sensibly believe both naturalism and evolution. So, the, and, and when, I, when I speak of naturalism, I'm going to take naturalism to include materialism with respect to human beings. Okay, so I'm, in, I'm taking naturalism to include materialism with respect to human beings. If you object and say, well, a naturalist doesn't have to be a materialist about human beings, okay, then what I'm really arguing against is naturalism, materialism, and evolution, saying you can't sensibly hold all three of those things. All right. Now, a materialist about human beings thinks that there is no immaterial soul or self or anything like that. Um, Descartes, for example, thought that a human being was really an immaterial substance, in that respect, like God himself, an immaterial substance that was related to a particular material object, namely his or her body. All right. So Descartes thought 
what he really was was a thing that wasn't a material object at all, but rather an immaterial self or soul, something like that, which could use a particular body. So for example, I can use this body, you can use your body, and the like, all right? The materialist says that isn't true, <coughs> and that a human being is just a material object through and through. And what I want to argue now is that you really can't sensibly be a naturalist, someone who thinks there's no such person as God and also thinks human beings are material objects, and accept, believe in evolution. And the first premise of my argument is this. The probability that, well, let, let me back up just a bit. This argument has to do with our, what we could call our cognitive faculties. Memory, for example, and... Um, perception whereby you learn about the external world. Um, Thomas Reed talked about sympathy, whereby you can tell what someone else is thinking or feeling quite often just by looking at their face. Um, I can tell sometimes that my wife is annoyed at some little silly thing I did just by looking at her, all right? Um, maybe induction whereby you can learn about the future from your experience of the past and the like. These are our cognitive faculties, and we take them to be reliable. I mean, we just automatically assume that they are. I just automatically assume without any kind of argument that there are lots of people in front of me because that's the way it looks to me, all right? The first premise of, my, of this argument is that the probability that our faculties are reliable, that they give us truth about the world, that the beliefs they produce in us are for the most part true, the probability that they are reliable, given naturalism and evolution, is low. So there I'm talking about the probability of one proposition given on the assumption that some other proposition is true, right? Conditional probability, people call it. So for example, um, the probability that Jock is a Mormon, given that Jock lives in Scotland, that's pretty low, right? Very few Mormons in Scotland. The probability that Brigham is a Mormon, given that Brigham lives in Salt Lake City, that'll be much higher, okay? So the idea, the probability of one proposition given another. It's sort of like saying what things would be like if that one, if the other proposition were true. So here what I'm saying is something like this. If naturalism and evolution were true together, then um, our faculties would probably not be reliable. That's the first premise. Then the, the second premise is this. If you see that the first premise is true, and furthermore, you believe naturalism and evolution, then you have a defeater for your belief that your faculties are reliable, a reason to give up that belief, a reason not to accept it any longer. So a defeater for a belief I have is another belief I come to have such that as long as I hold that second defeating, defeating belief, I can no longer sensibly rationally hold the first belief, the defeated one. So what I say in, then is that, um, is that in my second premise, if you accept the first premise and you see that the probability of N and E of uh, our, our faculties are reliable, given naturalism and evolution, if you see that that's low, then you have a defeater for the proposition that your faculties are in fact reliable. And if you have a defeater for that, you have a defeater for any belief that is formed on the basis of your cognitive faculties, which of course is all of them. So in particular, then you get a defeater for naturalism and evolution, that thing that you started off by believing, you get a, uh, you get a defeater for that. And in this way, believing in naturalism and evolution is, you might say, self-defeating. It shoots itself in the foot. It's uh, self-referentially inconsistent, if you want a more kind of a philosophical sounding name for it, all right? Well, now, with respect to this argument, um, I think it's the first premise that needs the most defense. 
The first premise is the claim that the probability of your faculties being reliable, given naturalism and evolution, naturalism including materialism, is low. All right? Why well, think that's true? Well, here's, here's why you should think that's true. Um, if you think about what a belief would be from the point of view of materialism, right, I've got the belief that all men are mortal, that seven plus five equals 12, that, <clears throat> that I live in Michigan and the like. If you say, well, now what sort of thing is a belief if materialism is true? A belief would have to be something like um, an event, a long-standing event or process in your nervous system or in my nervous system since I was talking about my beliefs. That's what a belief would have to be. And a belief would have two different kinds of properties, two different kinds of properties. On the one hand, it would have neurophysiological properties, properties that specified, say, how many neurons there are in this particular process or event, and what the rate of fire is in the various different parts, the rate of fire of these neurons in various different parts of this, um, of this event. And um, how the rate of fire in one part depends on the rate of fire in some other part, okay? Neurophysiological properties. Everybody with me so far? Yes. <laughs> Neurophysiological properties, but then also it's got another property too. A belief would have to have a content. It would have to be the belief that P for some particular proposition P. It would have to, you might say, somehow reach out and grab a certain proposition that all men are mortal, that seven plus five equals 12, that I live in um, Michigan. Have to, it would have to reach out and grab one particular proposition as opposed to all the other ones, right? And that proposition would be its content. And now here's the, um, here's the nub of the argument for this first premise. Um, if you ask, what makes a given action occur? What causes a given bit of behavior? So I raised my arm. Suppose, uh, suppose a belief is involved in that. Suppose, let's say, I believe I would like to a drink of water, so I open this cap, all right? So it's on the basis of that belief. But now, what kind of, which of the properties of the two kinds of properties of the belief is relevant to that to the causation of that behavior? Well, I think it's uh, what's, I think what the relevant properties are those neurophysiological properties. It's by virtue of this beliefs, this uh, structure, sending messages down various nervous channels, these messages arriving in my arm, my arms going up, or my arms picking up this, uh, this bottle. It's by virtue of those neurophysiological properties that a belief causes whatever it does. It doesn't cause whatever it causes by virtue of its content. If it had a different content but the same neurophysiological properties, it would still cause the same, have the same causal effects with respect to behavior. And that means that evolution can't really, evolution, natural selection, can't really see belief content at all. It can, it can modify our behavior in the direction of greater fitness, and also modify various mental, um, various neuronal structures and the like, various brain processes and structure, structures in the direction of greater adaptiveness. But it can't modify structures with respect to whether or not, whether or not they have a certain content. Evolution wouldn't care one way or the other what the content was. And that means if you think about the given, if you think about, say, some other creatures on another planet who, like us, hold beliefs and are also, as materialists think themselves, just material objects, that means that if you ask what the likelihood that any particular belief that they've got has true content, it's going to be more or less 50-50. Could be true, could be false. Evolution would have had no way of modifying it's this creature's faculties in the direction of greater, of, of greater truth or more truth with respect to the contents of these beliefs. So if, and if that's true, if the probability with respect to any belief is 
uh, that are, of being true is 50-50, then the likelihood that your cognitive faculties are reliable, that say they produce a predominance of true beliefs over false, that's going to be pretty low. If you have, say, 100 different independent beliefs and the probability with respect to any one of them that is true is roughly 50-50, then the likelihood that, say, three quarters of those beliefs are true, that's going to be very low. That'll be something like one out of a million or so. So then that's the argument for the first premise, that the probability of our faculties being reliable on naturalism and evolution is low. And I'm trusting that you remember the rest of the argument because I've used up my time and I won't say anything more. But, uh, but just by way of conclusion, here I said I wouldn't say anything more and, and I just made a liar out of myself. <laughs> by way of conclusion, I don't think there's any conflict at all between Christian belief or theistic belief more generally and evolution, but I do think there is conflict between evolution on the one hand and naturalism on the other. Thank you. So in the first part of your presentation, you argued that there isn't any inconsistency between right. evolution on yeah. the one hand and religious belief on the other. I'm going to ask if you think a weaker claim, uh, a claim weaker than the claim that evolutionary, uh, evolution and religious belief are inconsistent, might still be true. So we might think, there, even if they're not inconsistent, there is a tension between evolutionary theory on the one hand and religious belief on the other. Um, so imagine... Uh, life before Darwin. We really have no idea how structures like eyes or nervous systems or brains or hearts could come about if not for the activity of some designer. Um, in, our, in our experience, complex systems, whenever we know how they came about, uh, it's because there was some intelligent creature designing them, like watches or water mills or things like that. But then once we... Uh, once we get evolutionary theory, we have an alternative explanation. And maybe the alternative explanation doesn't entail that religious beliefs are false. But you might still think it takes a lot of the plausibility away from religious beliefs. You know, before, we were forced to accept religious beliefs. That's not entirely uncontroversial. David Hume thought we weren't. But I think a lot of philosophers would agree that before Darwin, we were almost forced to accept religious beliefs. Whereas afterwards, the availability of an alternative explanation means that we don't have to. Maybe we can go even a little bit further and appeal to something like Occam's razor. Right. It says if you don't need to appeal to some entity uh, like God to explain the evidence you've got, um, if you've got a more parsimonious explanation that uh, appeals to, you know, has fewer moving parts, appeals to fewer entities, something like that, it's simpler, uh, then that's the more plausible explanation in light of your total evidence. And so as I understood the first part of your talk, Nothing really told against that kind of view about there being a tension, if not an inconsistency, between evolutionary theory on the one hand and religious belief on the other. Okay. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Um, by the way, you can ask questions about my, my talk, too, all right? Um, I don't know if, I don't know if, that, <clears throat> if those are the, if you, have, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. Now, with respect to your suggestion, Dan, um, it seems to me that depends on the idea that one believes in God as a kind of theory or an explanation. So God is, why do I believe in God? Well, because it's the best explanation of this, that, or the other thing. And, um, and my idea is that people don't typically believe in God in that way. They don't look around the world and say, this world is really complicated, look at all these amazing things and so on. It must be that there is an all-powerful being, holy good, and so on, who has created the world. I don't think that's how it goes. There are lots of beliefs we hold, and some of them are the most, are, are most imp among the most important beliefs to us that we don't hold by virtue of finding explanation, finding them as an explanation for other things, or finding evidence for them in the sense of other beliefs we've got that support the belief that we're talking about. So, for example, we all believe that there are other persons. And uh, philosophers from the time of Descartes all the way to Hume were sort of tried to figure out, you know, well, 
what's the evidence for that, that there are other persons? Of course, there are, let's suppose it's clear that there are bodies, but what's my evidence for thinking that these bodies, all the ones I see before me, are connected with minds or that um, there are centers of consciousness connected with these bodies? After all, I can't. I can't see such a center of consciousness. I can't feel it. Um, I don't have any sort of direct access to it. What makes me think that there is any such thing? And um, the, con the conclusion from modern philosophy up through Hume, roughly speaking, is, well, there really doesn't seem to be much by way of a decent argument there. There doesn't really seem to be much by way of evidence that should drive me out of, say, solipsism into the idea that there are lots of other people other centers of consciousness as well as myself. And in fact, tiny children from the time they were six months old, maybe even earlier, show signs of holding beliefs about, uh, about the thoughts and feelings of, their, of others, of their, their parents, their mother, for example. Um, it just, just, it's something we just, we just automatically do. We form such beliefs, you might say, in the basic way, not on the basis of other beliefs, but themselves as among our basic beliefs, the ones that we that we form, that we use as evidence for other things. Well, that's how I'm inclined to think it goes with respect to belief in God for most people. It's not that most of us believe in the existence of God, those of us who do, on the basis of propositional evidence or anything like that. Not that we're looking for an explanation on God is the explanation. It's rather that we just find ourselves with a belief. It just seems right. Um, and in fact, I guess there is now um, evidence from the cognitive science of religion that the vast majority of the world's peoples do believe in something like in God or something like God, in a creator uh, worthy of worship and the like, or something like that. So, so I would say, I don't think that um, discovering that if we were using God for the explanation of something, now we've got a, another explanation. I don't, think that, I don't think that does any damage to religious belief or theistic belief at all. Do you think it depends on what attitudes you start out with? So I can imagine for somebody who starts out finding it very plausible that God exists, uh, they'll treat the belief as innocent until proven guilty. So if evolutionary theory comes along, as long as it's not inconsistent with this belief, then I'll, I'll continue believing it. But imagine somebody who starts out relatively agnostic. Uh, before Darwin, they do think, you know, even if initially they're not quite sure whether there's a God or not, they see these arguments based on the existence of these complex structures. Do you think for somebody like that, then evolutionary theory uh, does undermine one reason to believe in God? Yeah, I think if, um, if someone's main motivation for believing in God is that they think God is uh, a good explanation of the features of the world, including the very complex, enormous variety we find in the living world, if that's, um, if that's someone's basis for belief in God, then discovering some alternative explanation would um, reduce its probability or its likelihood. Right, right. Great. I wanted to ask a question about the, the second part of your talk, too, the, the, uh, the argument that uh, belief in evolution not only doesn't uh, conflict with belief in religion, but that it actually conflicts with right. naturalism. Um, so in particular, I wanted to ask about the first premise of that, that argument. Um, so I want to start by just presenting some prima facie reasons to be skeptical about it, and then we can see how that, um, how that interacts with the, the more detailed argument you gave for the first premise. Okay. Um, so just off the top of my head, it feels like there are reasons why uh, 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 evolution ought to care about whether certain of my beliefs are true. Um, if I have false beliefs about where the food is or about whether the tiger over there is uh, you know, coming towards me or running away from me, then it seems like that's, uh, I might not get to reproduce. Uh, those are the sort of things that are hazardous to your health, having false beliefs about those matters. Right. Um, so if that's right, then there must be something, so something wrong with the argument for the first premise. And I wanted to try and get at, um, at what that might be. Um, so if I understood the argument right, it seemed like you were thinking that um, we can distinguish between these neural and physiological properties of beliefs and these content properties of beliefs, and they can vary pretty much independently. You know, hold fixed right. the neural physiological properties, and the content could be you know, pretty much whatever you like. Um, and it seems to me that on some you know, materialistic views about belief, that's not going to be true. So 
here's um, maybe a sort of crude materialistic view of belief, but I hope that what I say about this sort of view might carry over to more sophisticated materialistic views about belief. Um, so say you have a sort of behaviorist view, where you think that, uh, say, having a belief that it's going to rain just is a matter of being in some neural state that causes you to behave in certain ways. Which ways? Well, the ways that make sense if it's going to rain, maybe. Uh, the ways that make sense if it's going to rain. Maybe ways, you know, causes you to take an umbrella, um, causes you to uh, put galoshes on. Uh, I think this is certainly going to be too crude for reasons that lots of philosophers have argued, but right. for now, let's um, set that aside for just a sec. So if you had that kind of behaviorist view, um, then you're not going to be able to, to independently vary the neural and physiological properties of a belief and the content properties. Because if I start out disposed to carry an umbrella, but then we monkey with my brain so that I'm not disposed to carry with an umbrella, well, that belief no longer has the same content that it did. It's no longer a belief that it's going to rain. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, if, I don't know, if behaviorism were, th were true, things would go quite differently. But I guess you and I and everybody else agrees that behaviorism isn't true. So, I mean, um, if, if you try to, behaviorism would be the idea that you can analyze a given belief, you can say what that, really, what that belief really is in terms of the behavior and circumstances of the believer. But if you try that in any particular case, it simply doesn't work out, right? I mean, so, uh, I don't know, I, I say that I believe that all men are mortal. Um, well, that's a bit of behavior, and I might be motivated, I might say that um, because I really do believe that all men are mortal, or I might not be telling the truth, or a wide variety of other circumstances. And if you try to find some list of circumstances together with my behavior that together entails that I form, that I have that belief, well, you really can't do it. Nobody's ever been able to do that. So I guess my answer would be, well, okay, if behaviorism were true, maybe, maybe you'd be right. But you and I agree that it isn't true. Um, and, and I guess I don't see how it would carry over to more sensible views, materialist views as to what a belief is. So my thought was that, um, yeah, well, it's, it's true. Uh, I, I'm not a behaviorist. Uh, not many people still are. Uh, my thought was that it's at least not obvious to me that this feature of behaviorism Namely, that according to behaviorism, it's not possible to independently vary the neurophysiological properties of beliefs on the one hand and the content properties of beliefs on the other. That feature might be shared by other more sophisticated views that avoid some of the traditional objections to behaviorism. Yeah. Well, maybe so. We'd have to, I'd like to take a look at them, so to speak, one at a time and, and see whether that's, actually, whether that's actually right. On the face of it, it looks as if they as if they could perfectly well vary. You don't, one doesn't see any necessary logical connection anyway between the two. Um, but I'm right. I mean, that would be an avenue for further exploration. Okay, right. I want to ask one more question about, um, about the relationship between evolutionary theory on one hand and, um, and religious belief on the other before segueing into some more general questions about your views on philosophy and religion. So. Here's a different sort of strategy people sometimes appeal to, to argue that there's some kind of tension between belief in evolution on the one hand and religious belief on the other. Um, so the suggestion is that um, once you go in for evolutionary theory, you can explain your uh, temptation to hold various religious beliefs. So you referred to the cognitive science of religion, and um, I think, yeah, you're right, a lot of work shows that belief in um, at the very least, you know, supernatural entities, maybe not belief in uh, uh, an all-powerful god, but at least you know, belief in entities that we don't find in the natural world, um, you know, belief in, in spirits or uh, belief in, um, uh, in ghosts. You know, that, that these are very, um, they're very natural for us. You, you, know, you find them all over the world. Um, people don't, you know, children don't need to be taught that, uh, that spirits or ghosts exist to be disposed to believe in them. They're, um, they need to be taught that they don't exist to be disposed right. to reject them. Um, and so suppose uh, you think once we accept these, uh, uh, this view that there is some sort of powerful evolutionary explanation for why we're tempted to hold mm -hmm. um, religious or supernatural beliefs of various sorts, that that ought to undermine our tendency to take those beliefs seriously. Um, maybe an analogy. Um, 
here's a very, uh, very common tab. There's a very common taboo against incest in all sorts of cultures. Right. Um, and people will say that incest is wrong, even if, say, there's no chance of um, having a child with various birth defects, or even if there's no chance that the you know, relationship between the, the parties will, um, you know, you, you can construct hypothetical scenarios where all the usual sorts of objections to incest don't apply. People will still say, that's a terribly wrong thing to do. And you might offer a sort of evolutionary undermining explanation of this. You say, well, there's a good reason why, um, from an evolutionary point of view, it's advantageous to have a really strong taboo against incest. But once you see that, that undermines the thought that it applies even in these very special cases where all the more practical objections um, uh, don't apply. So I wonder you know, what you'd say to the suggestion that a similar sort of debunking argument could be offered in the religious case. You know, once we mm -hmm. have an evolutionary <clears throat> explanation of our temptation to hold various religious beliefs, we ought to take that temptation less seriously. Well, I mean, um, there the suggestion basically is that if you can find a kind of natural explanation for our holding religious belief, then that somehow undermines it. Um, but I wonder if that's true. I mean, you might be able to find a natural explanation for a lot of things about us that we, for example, hold perceptual beliefs. You know, it's really a good thing to hold perceptual beliefs and so on, and uh, there's a good evolutionary explanation if we didn't, if our ancestors hadn't done this, they probably wouldn't have lasted very long, would not have had the chance to reproduce, et cetera. That certainly doesn't cast the least doubt on the fact, on, the, on our belief that our, <clears throat> on our inclination to accept our perceptual beliefs. We, we're not gonna say, well, for that, re for that reason, they're, not pro they're probably not true, or there's some problem about them, or maybe they're not, uh, they're not justified, or they, We've done some kind of damage to them by finding this natural explanation. I don't think there's any reason to think that at all in that case, nor in the case of our belief in other people or a belief in the past and so on. Um, so I don't see why there should be in the religious case either. I, I, I think maybe in some cases you can find a sort of debunking natural explanation for certain kinds of beliefs, but for others, finding a natural explanation doesn't debunk them at all. And the question, I guess, just is, well, which way is it with respect to belief in God? So, so here's one strategy for trying to draw a distinction. I'm not sure how, how promising it is, but you might think in the, and actually this probably gets into the issues we were just talking about uh, uh, concerning the evolutionary argument against naturalism. But here's something you might think. In the perceptual case, we do have a naturalistic explanation of our temptation to believe, say, our eyes, uh, you know, to believe that there's a bottle of water here. Right. But that explanation, um, the explanation for why it's evolutionarily advantageous for us to hold these beliefs, depends on those beliefs being true. You might think, why is it advantageous for us to believe our eyes? Well, if we do, then we'll have true beliefs about our environment and be able to um, identify the sources of food and drink. But you might think nothing like that works in, say, the incest case. Um, the explanation for why... Uh, why it's evolutionarily advantageous to have a taboo against incest doesn't appeal to the idea that incest right. really is wrong, just yeah. that, it's, um, that it's harder to spread your genes if you're engaging yeah. in incest. Yeah, well, I guess what I'd say about that is that in the case of um, your suggestion that um, it's by virtue of their truth that our perceptual beliefs, um, the explanation proceeds in terms of their truth, by virtue of their truth. Since, since the world is there, you know, and since uh, it would be a lot better off if we can actually perceive it and the like than if we can't. Uh, so the explanation, the, explanation proceed, the explanation of our tendency to hold these beliefs proceeds in terms of the truth of those beliefs. It presupposes the truth of those beliefs. We know that the world is there and so on, and that it's like we think it is by virtue of perception. Well, we can offer that kind of explanation in the religious case, too. Why is it that we um, are inclined to believe in God? Well, the explanation is that God has created us in such a way that we naturally form beliefs about him because he wanted us to know of his, know of his existence. So I would say, I would say that, belief, that kind of explanation is the mate, so to speak, of the one you were giving. And if you can, if you can use the very, sort of, uh, the very sort of belief that you're trying to explain in stating the explanation and giving the explanation in the one case, then you can do it in the other case, too. So what if there's an, an evolutionary explanation of uh, religious beliefs that doesn't go via the truth of religious beliefs, maybe one that um, 
appeals to the value of social cohesion and says that, a, say, a community that has uh, religious or supernatural beliefs of various sorts is more likely to be stable in various ways. Maybe people are less likely to violate its norms than one uh -huh. that doesn't. Yeah, I mean, uh, suppose I learned that. Um, would that sort of reduce my inclination to accept the religious beliefs I do, in fact, accept? I learned that they are useful for uh, cohesion, that they make society function better and the like. I wouldn't think so. I might take that as further evidence. Uh, I mean, I, I don't say I do believe on the basis of evidence, but as sort of confirmation or something like that. Right. Okay, I'd like to segue into the more general questions about your views on philosophy and religion. And these um, are based in part on some questionnaires that the, the people at Veritas handed out uh, to the uh, NYU students and that they've been handing out over the last few weeks. Um, so, you know, Professor Plantinga has written a whole lot on philosophy and religion, and uh, uh, this is, these questions amount to asking him for, to just expound on some of his views. So the first one is, uh, is a big one, something you've thought a lot about. Um, so a lot of people asked variants of the following question. Um, you know, how is it that you can reconcile the, uh, the existence of all sorts of bad things in the world? Um, People do terrible things to one another. Um, people get diseases, there are earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, um, stuff like that. How can you reconcile all that with the existence of a, of a God who knows about these things because he's omniscient and who's able to stop them because he's omnipotent um, and who you might think would prefer to stop them because he's good and would prefer that terrible things like this not happen? Right. <clears throat> well, I think the first thing to be said about that is that's a very serious question for believers in God. It goes all the way back, at very least, to the book of Job in the Old Testament, where uh, Job's, where Job is afflicted, and the prologue to the to the book, the devil and God are talking about Job, and the devil says, "Well, Job's belief in you only goes skin deep. You know, let me afflict him a bit, and he'll turn on you and uh, re reject you altogether." And God says, "No, that's not true." But he, and he went and he lets the devil afflict Job. And Job's comforters, and so Job become, he, he winds up uh, suffering from sores of various kinds, and his family is killed and the like. He's in really miserable condition, sitting on an ash heap, scraping away at his sores in the back and the like. And Job's comforters, in quotes, gather around him, and, uh, and they, they suggest, some of them at least, that he, they, he should just curse God and die. I mean, forget this whole God business altogether. Look, look what's happening to you. Job doesn't do this, um, but it's a very serious question. And I'd like, and in, and in some ways, if you think about some of the horrifying things that go on in our world, the Holocaust, for example, but that's just one example, although it's a particularly awful example, it sometimes can seem um, insensitive or improper to talk about it in a kind of kind of academic fashion, you know, in a kind of reflective fashion. But I, I, would, I would say, uh, first of all, that suppose you do think that there's a kind of, uh, that there's something like evidence against belief in God from the existence of evil. Suppose you think that. You might still, all things considered, given, given whatever it is that pushes you towards believing in God, you might, all things considered, still wind up believing in doing so perfectly sensibly. Um, but I'd like to suggest something else. Um, people talk about theodicies, ways, ways of justifying the ways of God to mankind, theodicies uh, from uh, God and justice. Those, um, you can think about it like this. Imagine God, before he's created, there are all these different possible worlds he could create. He could make this world, or that world, or this world, that world. Um, but he wants, of course, to make a really good world. That's his aim, to create a really good world. And now suppose we ask ourselves, what is it that makes one world a good world? Maybe a better world than some other world. What would be good-making properties among these worlds which are open to God. He could create any one of them, let's say. Um, well, when I think about that, and it's not only me who has thought this, when I think about that, I think that one feature of a world that can make it a really good world 
is the truth of the whole Christian story in that world. I mean, think about the Christian story. Here is God, the first being of the universe, all powerful, all knowing and the like, who creates human beings. These human beings turn on him, they reject him. They prefer their own uh, glory to his glory. They, they, they reject this being that's created them. They, they turn away from him. They sin against him. Sometimes they mock him and the like. Well, now, what, would God, what is God's response according to the Christian story? The response is not like that of some Eastern potentate to have them all boiled in oil or something like that. No, God's response is to send his only his son, the second person of the Trinity, into the world to suffer, to suffer and die, to die, to suffer and die at the hands of the Romans, Pontius Pilate, and the like of that. So the second person of the Trinity has to undergo the suffering involved in this, and the first person, God the Father, has to undergo the suffering involved in seeing his son treated in this way. And this is to make it possible once more for human beings to be in, in fellowship with God, to be justified before God, to be right in God's, in God's sight. Now, if you think about it, that's a display of, that's a kind of an absolutely over the top, amazing display of, of love. And uh, it makes sense to me at any rate to say that worlds in which this occur our, our worlds are very, very good worlds. That is um, an extremely powerful, good-making property of worlds. So if God wants to create a really good world, and if um, among, if incarnation and atonement, we could just short it, uh, shorten the Christian story to that, incarnation and atonement, if that's a characteristic of, all of, of many of these very, very good worlds, well, then he may very well pick one of them. But any world in which there is incarnation and atonement will be a world in which, there, uh, in which there is suffering, in which there is sin and consequent suffering. And not just a little bit of it, not just a, 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 a insignificant peccadillo on the part of an otherwise admirably disposed angel. It'll have to be a whole lot more than that. How much more, it's hard to say. But I mean, the main point then would be that the good worlds contain incarnation and atonement, and worlds that contain incarnation and atonement are bound to contain pain, suffering, and evil. So that would be, uh, that would be a suggestion anyway. You might call that the O Felix Culpa, O Felix Culpa uh, theodicy from the, uh, the from the, on, on, on Easter Saturday night, in the Catholic liturgy, there are, there are the words, O Felix Culpa, O happy sin that occasioned such a marvelous response on the part of God, and so on, so it goes, yeah. Just one quick follow-up to that. Um, how does that, or, or does, it, um, uh, does it account for suffering that occurs after the incarnation and atonement have, well, after there's been incarnation, after, um, say Christ has been crucified and has suffered for our sins. I'm not quite sure I understand how that, um, that account explains why there'd need to be lots of suffering and bad things that happen even after that whole story is, is um, well, not entirely finished, but, um, but why those parts of it are finished. I guess I'm not quite clear, i quite sure that I see the, the problem. I mean, why should it, uh, why should, I mean, the idea would be, well, we should just stop once incarnation and atonement has occurred, then from then on. Sure, yeah. No, no more. Uh, well, I mean, the, it's, not, it's not as if, that is, um, the story is that there are creatures who rebel against God, who have turned against God, and then they, get, they can be redeemed by virtue of, of God, of incarnation and atonement. And uh, to put it kind of crudely, the more the better, you know. Why, why stop with just the first, you know, the first uh, 15, 20 million or something like that? Okay, great. Okay, so the next question that a number of NYU students asked, again, in different varieties, um, uh, it's a question concerning relativism. So um, roughly, you know, there's lots of disagreement concerning uh, 
religious matters, um, the relationship between religious and science, or religion and science. Um, do you? No, you don't, but do, do you think that uh, some form of relativism is, uh, <laughs> is a good way to respond to that? Um, and then the more important part, if not, uh, why not? <laughs> uh, well, basically, I don't think relativism makes any sense. I mean, that's basically why not. Uh, I prefer to hold views that make sense. Relativism doesn't make sense, therefore I prefer not to hold it. But <laughs> relativism, as I understand, well, I mean, of course, there are many varieties of it, and there are sophisticated ways of putting it and unsophisticated ways and so on. But <clears throat> to put it at a basic and unsophisticated way of thinking about it, it's the idea that there really isn't any truth. There is no particular way the world is. There is basically how it looks to me, or how it is relative to me, and how it is looks to you, how it looks to George over here, but there's no, there's no truth just as such about how the world is or about anything else. Um, but when the relativist says this, he doesn't take that to be just true relative to him. He thinks it's really true, just plain true. And, um, and it seems to me it's really impossible to get away from the notion that there is such a thing as truth and that for any, any proposition or belief you come up with, either that belief or proposition is true or else it isn't true. It's not, it's true relative to George but not true relative to Sam. In a way that doesn't even make sense unless you mean by that something like that, well George believes it and Sam doesn't, that's okay. But to say that it's true relative to this guy and not true relative to that guy, as far as I can make out, that doesn't make sense. Truth isn't the sort of thing that, that holds relative to one person and not relative to another. And I think anybody that states relativism, um, at least ordinarily, um, doesn't take the statement of it to be relative just to him. He takes it to be the way things are. Yeah. As some background, relativism is, is often a favorite whipping boy among philosophers. But I'm going to try and stick up for at least some form, or I don't know about stick up for, but at least ask you what you think about uh, maybe a weaker form of relativism. So um, you can be a relativist about truth and say, uh, yeah, it's true relative to you that God exists. It's false relative to somebody else that God exists. Um, say we're not talking about that sort of relativism, but just a sort of um, a relativism about reasonableness. Um, mm. So maybe it's uh, reasonable relative to you and and your epistemic standards, that's a phrase people sometimes use in this context, but it just means your sort of standards of reasoning or what you regard as sensible, good reasoning. Maybe it's reasonable relative to those standards to believe in God. Uh, it's unreasonable relative to some other standards. And maybe there's not much to be said about which, um, which set of standards is the right set of standards or the best set of standards. All we can say is that, well, yeah, relative to your standards, it's reasonable to believe uh, these religious claims. Relative to some other standards, it's not. Um, well, I mean, in the first place, what's reasonable to believe does depend on one's circumstances. That certainly seems, that certainly seems right. Um, so the thought, so, so what's the thought? I mean, the thought, the thought is the thought that in general, um, all we can say is, well, it's sensible from Sam's point of view to believe this, but not sensible from somebody else's point of view. And then what? I mean, there's, uh, what, what, what does one infer from that? I mean, what I want to, what I want to say is, uh, what I have to do is look at the questions that I'm interested in as carefully as I can and investigate them in, in as much detail as I can and learn as much as I can about them. And then I'll wind up believing something one way or the other. And that's what the right thing for me to believe is. And I can't say that it's going to turn out the same way for everybody else. Maybe not. But what else can I do than, than believe what seems to me to be right? I mean, maybe, uh, maybe I can't convince other people, but that doesn't mean I should sort of stop believing what I do believe or think it doesn't make any difference or that, that there's no real issue here. Uh, none of that seems to me to follow. You certainly find the same thing in philosophy. You find some people are materialists and some aren't, and some people believe in abstract objects like propositions and states of affairs and properties, Plato's whole menagerie, and others don't. And typically, philosophers don't typically convince each other. They don't wind up in agreement. Um, but what follows from that? I mean, 
maybe that's too bad, but nothing fr follows from, from it with respect to what you ought to do. I mean, it isn't, so if I think I can't convince um, materialist philosophers that dualism is true, uh, I can't, maybe I can't do that, but that doesn't mean I should stop believing it or that I should just throw up my arms and uh, you know, say, oh, a pox on both your houses or anything like that. What I have to do is I have to just follow, follow the argument or the evidence or whatever we've got, whatever impulses we have here, follow them as carefully as I can and, and stick with what I come up with. Great. Okay, now uh, we're going to move on to the audience Q&A section. So I've got some audience questions. Um, here's the first one. Uh, what about the argument stating that conflict isn't manifested in mere religion, which limits its tenets in the belief, uh, limits its tenets to the belief in a creator God? The conflict arises when you look at the specific tenets in religion, like the world was created in six days, or the whole earth has been flooded in the past, etc. These things have been proven wrong by science. Uh, I guess I'm, in, I guess I'm in, inclined to think that uh, that a version of Christian belief according to which the earth is only, the world is only 4,000, no, say 6,000, or maybe even 10,000 years old, I guess I do think that would be extremely problematic and that we've got some really good reason to think that uh, that's not the way it is. Uh, but I don't, but that's not part of Christian belief as such. You won't find that in any creeds. There are some Christians who believe it, um, but I would say it's not part of Christian belief just as such. And I would go on to say that when you look at the Bible, there are very various different, there are very many different kinds of discourse that it contains. Uh, there is praise and there is history. And uh, there are, say, Jesus parables, parables he tells in order to make a certain kind of point. Well, if you look at the first couple of chapters of Genesis, they look a lot, they look like, a sort of a poetic parable, you might say. They don't, they don't have the same feel as what you find when you get a little further along, say, um, where there is an account of what Abraham did. He went here and then he went there and, and um, he had sons, Isaac and Jacob and the like of that. He got married. The first, the first couple of chapters don't have that kind of feel. They have much more a kind of poetic, much more of a kind of, of parable-like, parabolic whatever the right word is there, feel to them. So, so, uh, so I would say what one has to do there is to try to decide just how much of those chapters is supposed to be God intends for us to take literally. And I don't think the answer to that is just obvious. I guess I'm inclined to think that it's important to think there was an original human pair, Adam and Eve, uh, who fell into sin because the New Testament makes reference, Paul makes reference in various places to Adam and Eve. But as for the rest, some of the other elements of the story, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the snake and so on, maybe, maybe these things aren't intended to be taken literally. One quick follow up on that. Um, so you've said you think um, evolutionary theory in general is compatible with, with Christian belief. Um, that can seem to put some pressure on the idea that there was an original pair of humans. If you think that humans evolved gradually from uh, Australopithecines or, um, you know, Homo erectus or, you know, well. So that, that sort of picture suggests that, you know, if you look backwards, you're not going to find a clear first pair of humans. You'll find yeah. things that get, you know, more and more human-like without there being some natural pair to point to and say, yeah, those are the first two humans. Yeah. Well, people talk about bottlenecks in the whole lineage leading to current humanity. Um, maybe a bottleneck when there were, say, 10,000 10, individuals, something like that. Um, it's entirely compatible with evolutionary theory that God should pick a certain pair of these individuals. I mean, and we can imagine them as having descended from earlier forms of life, pick a certain pair and treat them in a special way or give them a special property or characteristic by virtue of which they could then be said to be created in God's image. And furthermore, it's perfectly possible that these two original, that these original pair should have done something wrong, sinned against God, turned back, turned their backs on God. And if um, both of these characteristics are heritable and dominant, so that 
if uh, two individuals mate and one of them's got these characteristics and the other one doesn't, then their offspring will have them, then it could be that all present human beings are, are in fact descendants of that pair, of others as well, but they are descendants of that pair. That'd be one way to think of it. Okay. So next question. Um, do you think that it's truly possible to persuade slash defend slash reason slash prove the veracity of Christianity short of the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I think you can certainly argue about Christianity, but I guess fundamentally, I agree with John Calvin here. What leads someone in the last analysis to, to see the, the truth, the beauty and the truth of, of the whole Christian story is the work of the Holy Spirit in that person's heart. So, so John Calvin spoke both of uh, what he called a sensus divinitatis, by virtue of which people come to believe in God, come to think there is such a person as God, see God's hand in the world and so on on the one hand. And then when it came to specifically Christian belief, which goes well beyond uh, belief in God, incarnation and atonement and so on, his idea was that uh, in the last analysis, what the, the cognitive mechanism that brings it about that somebody has this belief, accepts it, is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I guess, I, I guess I'm inclined to believe, I'm kind of inclined to go along with Calvin. Given that I'm a Calvinist and that I teach at Calvin College, what else can I do? <laughs> so, uh, but of course, that, uh, that's not the only thing that's involved. I mean, uh, um, there, the kinds of um, responding to objections to Christian belief is also important. And um, carrying on some of the other things the questioner asks about, these things are also important. But, uh, but crucial and perhaps most important, I would, I would say, is the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so next question. Uh, could you explain your idea that reason is not necessary for a formulation of the belief in God? Well, I didn't really say uh, reason isn't necessary. What I said was that having propositional evidence isn't necessary, um, or at least it's a question as to whether it's necessary. There are lots of beliefs we have, as I said a little while ago, that we accept on the basis of other beliefs. Uh, for example, if I believe that 31 times 9,471 is X, I will believe that on the basis of a bunch of other beliefs, like. I don't know, nine times five is 45, et cetera. On the basis of all these others, I will come to this concluding belief. But there are a lot, but, but probably most of my beliefs aren't, aren't like that. Perceptual beliefs, for example, I believe that there are a lot of people in front of me and that I'm sitting on a stage and there's a glass of, or a bottle of water here and the like. I don't believe that on those on the basis of arguments or evidence from other propositions at all. I believe them on the basis of evidence, on the basis of, say, the evidence of sense, but I don't believe them on the basis of propositional evidence. I don't believe them because I've got an argument for them. And I guess I think uh, the same is true for belief in God. Most of us who believe in God don't believe because of some argument. It's rather, it's rather that it just seems right, just as it just seems right to me to think there are a lot of, that there are other people. It just seems right to me to think that there are many people in the audience here and the like, not on the basis of some kind of argument. It just seems right. That's the way, uh, that's the way I think belief in God is for most people. So from the inside, it just seems right. From the outside, you might say, well, you know, what's the explanation then? Uh, why does it just seem right? There it would be something like, Calvin's idea of a sense of divinity, a sense of divinitatis. Okay. Is a good retort to the atheist that even given evolution, nothing is said about what was before or caused the Big Bang? In other words, science can only speak to origins of different laws, whereas religion looks at actual creation. Why don't you read that again? So, uh, <laughs> Is a good retort to the atheist that even given evolution, nothing is said about what was before or caused the Big Bang? No, oh, sorry, that should have been. Is a good retort to the atheist? Yeah, okay. Didn't read it like a question, sorry. Uh, in other words, science can only speak to origins of different laws, whereas religion looks at actual creation. 
Oh, hmm. Why don't you answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, uh, uh, maybe we, uh, I'm trying to think of what the questioner has in mind there, you know. I mean, what exactly is, is the question? Uh, so science doesn't tell us what happened before the Big Bang. Fair enough, I guess, on many views. There isn't any before the Big Bang, so that science couldn't tell us about that, whereas religious, religions tell us about what the world is actually like. My, I guess I would have to say that science tries to tell us about what the world is actually like, too. I mean, you can think here of there's this old uh, uh, contrast between faith and reason. Nowadays, we speak of science and religion, but in the Middle Ages, people talked about faith and reason, so that each of faith and reason was, each of them is a source of belief or a source of knowledge. Again, to quote uh, John Calvin, he didn't think that faith is believing something, as Mark Twain said, that you know ain't true. No, he thought that you know something by faith. Faith is a sure and certain knowledge, so and so and so and so and such and such of God's benevolence towards us and the like. But it doesn't come from reason. It's not, reason isn't its source. Its source, Calvin thinks, is the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. So there are these two different sources and, um, and they both tell us, and they both tell us things about the world. It's not that, that religion tells us about uh, what the world is actually like and science tells us something else. Both faith and reason, both science and religion tell us about the world we actually live in. Just one strategy people will sometimes offer in response to questions like this um, is to say, so grant that, uh, Science can trace things back to the Big Bang, but can't give some further explanation of, say, why the Big Bang occurred, in particular, maybe oh, not yeah, why yeah. it occurred with the, um, uh, the initial conditions that it did. Maybe that's just some you know, unexplained uh, part of the theory. The re a retort that's often offered, then, is that there's no way to avoid having some unexplained explainers in your theory. So even if we say uh, it's because of God that the Big Bang occurred, yeah. Um, you know, there's a further question of, well, you know, why is it that God exists? Um, now, maybe we can answer that. Maybe some version of your ontological argument would give an answer to that. But um, I take it a, a natural way for, for an atheist to respond here is to think um, uh, there's no way to avoid positing some unexplained explainers. And so then the, the question is, which are the sort of more parsimonious or, or less implausible um, unexplained explainers to have in a theory? Okay. Uh, okay, here, next question. Uh, if God is real and did create the world, why does he allow such strong evidence and so much of it supporting the idea that the world is not his work, i.e. Darwin, DNA, evolution? <laughs> well, I mean, part of what I was arguing earlier on is that Darwinism doesn't give us any evidence against Christian belief, against belief in God, or more specifically Christian belief. So. So the question is, well, why is it that there is that sort of evidence? I guess I don't think it is evidence against the existence of God. I don't see any incompatibility between um, God's having created the world and the living world's having to come, come to be by virtue of some form of evolution. They seem to me to fit together okay, perfectly well. Uh, to what degree can one infer ethical imperatives or public policy from science? Boy, that's a hard question, too. You guys are asking all these hard questions. Haven't you got some easy ones? Look, th <laughs> look through that. You see if you find <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I guess I don't think science can, science can't tell us what's right or what's wrong, you know. But once we know what's right or what's wrong, however we learn it, uh, then science can help us implement policies that, that uh, promote the right, let's say, and minimize the wrong. So, so I don't think, so science could be intimately involved in the production of the right kind of public policies, but it can't be the whole shooting match. You also have to know what's really worth shooting at in order to, in order then to decide how to, how to achieve that. Okay. Uh, 
how does the particular example of the relationship between evolution and creationism help us understand the relationship between science as such and faith as such? Uh, science as such and faith as such. Um, some particular example. Um, would you read that again? Oh, sure. How does the particular example of the relationship between evolution and creationism help us understand the relationship between science as such and faith as oh, such? Oh, okay, now I get it, right, yeah. Well, I think it helps in this way. Somebody, some people think that there is some kind of conflict between science on the one hand and faith, say, Christian faith or the Christian religion on the other. <clears throat> and as I said at the very beginning of my talk, uh, people point to several different loci where, this, where, they, where it looks as if there is some kind of clash or where it's alleged that there is some kind of clash. Um, and um, this particular one, evolution and Christian belief, that's just one of these loci, but it helps one understand the relation between science and, Christ and, the Christ and Christian belief more generally if you take a look at any one of these loci and see whether there really is conflict or not. Uh, if it seems, if, as it seems to me, there isn't any conflict, then that's a step on the way to, to a kind of fuller understanding of the relation between religion and science. In order to do a complete job, we'd have to look at the, some of the other loci as well. For example, the idea that, uh, excuse me, <coughs> the idea that there's conflict between science on the one hand and miracles on the other, right? Jesus rising from the dead, Jesus changing water into wine and the like. And uh, well, there's no time now to go into this in any detail. Just as, an exa as another example, seems to me you can think about it like this. If you look into uh, physics textbooks at the statement of, um, say, conservation of energy or conservation of momentum, other conservation laws, these laws, uh, together with what they're deduced from, they're stated for closed systems, systems such that there is no, no causal input from outside the system, right? So um, it'll be sort of the conservation law will say energy is conserved in a closed system. If there's input from the outside, then all bets are off, then energy won't necessarily be conserved at all. Well, if the, if, if the laws of science more generally are stated for a closed system or for closed systems, um, then any time God does something special, any time there is a miracle, let's say, the systems in which that miracle takes place are not closed systems. They're not closed to causal input from the outside because there's causal input from God's activity into that system. So that the laws of science, uh, laws of nature more generally, aren't then violated by God's doing something special by raising somebody from the dead or something like that or changing water into wine. There's no violation of any laws of nature um, in, under, uh, on such an occasion because the laws are stated just for closed systems and and any system in which something like that happens, God acts in it in that way, is not a closed system. So more generally, the idea here would be to take a look one at another, one after another of the places, the loci where people think there is kind of conflict and see whether there really is or isn't. And that will certainly help us understand the relation between faith and science. Okay. This next one is a bit complicated, but um... I think I get it from the diagram. And I think it looks like a good, good no, but it looks like a good question too, so I'm happy to ask it. So uh, first question with, with a follow-up. Um, what is the probability that our senses are reliable given that there's an objective reality? Not given naturalism and evolution, just given this weaker thing, there's an objective reality. Now, here's the follow-up. If we understand this relative to no background beliefs at all, pro presumably pretty low. Um, so then, uh, the belief that there's an objective reality undermines my evidence for believing it too. Uh, I, I take it the thought is that um, uh, you said the probability that, uh, that our senses are reliable given evolution and naturalism, that's low, so there's an underminer. They think, well, the probability that our, belief, our senses are reliable given uh, just that you know, there's an objective reality or there's an external world, that doesn't seem too high either. 
Um, so there should be an underminer too, but that doesn't, seem, that doesn't seem right, the person is suggesting. So then the next part, more plausibly, we understand this question, this question, what's the probability that our senses are reliable given that there's an objective reality, relative to background beliefs on which it can come out high. But then why can't we understand uh, the question of what the probability that our senses are, are reliable given naturalism in the same way? Nick, you got all? That was a lot, sorry. Well, I mean, all these hard questions. I mean, that's, a, <laughs> <coughs> that's another hard one. Uh, right, so I think one way to think about that is as follows. Well, first of all, I have no idea what the probability that our cognitive faculties are reliable, given just that there is such a thing as true, truth and falsehood is. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, I don't know, is that low? I, I have the faintest idea. It's somewhere between zero and one. That's, a, that's about inclusive at that. That's about as best you can do. But I think there's another way to put this question which really makes sense. So uh, I didn't mean to disparage that way of putting it. That's not making sense. So um, I was talking about the probability of, of our faculties being reliable given naturalism and evolution, right? Well now, um, presumably you can add other things there, given naturalism and evolution and X, right? Now the question is, what can you put in for X? What would be an admissible substitution there for X? Uh, presumably you couldn't put in R itself. You couldn't put in just anything you believe. You do believe R. That's one of our background beliefs this person is talking about. R is one of our background beliefs that are, I'm sorry, I shouldn't just say R, that our faculties are reliable, which I've been calling R. That, that is one of our background beliefs, but you can't sensibly put that in there because if you could, then you could defeat any probabilistic argument against anything. So you can't do that. Well, what can you put in there? Uh, that might be a little tricky, but you can't put in anything that directly implies R, uh, nor I would say can you put in anything there that you believe just because you do believe R, um, just because you do believe that your cognitive faculties are in fact reliable. So, I mean, so the way in which this discussion would have to proceed is we'd have to see what uh, background beliefs the person who, the, the, the questioner, what background beliefs he has in mind. And, um, and maybe we'd find something really interesting uh, and maybe not. Okay, last two questions, um, kind of big picture ones. First one, why do you personally find Christianity so compelling or convincing, there's a slash. Or what? Or convincing, there's a slash. Right. That's, um, um, well, I mean, I, I, I guess I can't say a lot more than that when I think about this whole Christian story, I was saying how I thought that uh, the best possible worlds contain incarnation and atonement, the best worlds God could create. <clears throat> when I think about the whole Christian story, um, I just find it uh, overwhelmingly attractive. It just seems right to me. I can't think of much by way of uh, serious argument for it. There are arguments for Christian belief. Richard Swinburne gives some and various other people have, have given them. And while I think those arguments have uh, at least some probative value, I don't think they're strong enough to support genuine Christian commitment or genuine Christian belief. So sometimes uh, when, I, when I'm at prayer, uh, it seems to me that I feel God's presence and I just find myself uh, thankful for this whole gift of atonement so that sinners uh, like I and like the rest of us can in fact once more be in the right relationship with God. Uh, from the inside, as I, I said at a different connection earlier on, the most I can really say here is it just seems right, which is also the most I can say about, you know, my idea that there's been a past. I can't really give an argument, much of an argument for that. Bert, as Bertrand Russell said, it's compatible with all our evidence that the world popped into existence 10 seconds ago with all these uh, rusty, automobiles and crumbling mountains and apparent memories and the like of that. I can't give much of an argument in either of these cases, but uh, I, just, I just find it convincing. 
That's about the best I can say. That's from the inside. Now, in the case of perception, you just find yourself believing these things, and then there you've got this kind of outside explanation. Well, we've got this cognitive faculty, perception. We're so created that uh, under certain conditions, we form true beliefs about the world in response to various kinds of experience and the like. You can give the same kind of thing here, too. I mean, you can, you can say, as Calvin does, well, there's the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. Under certain conditions, God helps you see that this story is true. That, too, is a kind of uh, cognitive faculty. It's not a natural inborn one in created as perception is, but it's still a, a cognitive faculty. That may not be a good answer, but that's the best I can do. And last question. What advice would you give to those in the audience seeking truth? <laughs> Veritas. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if there's any sort of recipe one could give for seeking truth or winding up with true beliefs or winding up with, uh, with rational beliefs, justified beliefs. I don't think there's any kind of general recipe. All you can, all you can, all you can do is just uh, think about these things, talk about these things, learn as much as you can about these things. If you're sort of inclined towards Christian belief, you can temporarily at least try it out. You can go to church, you can read the Bible, you can talk to Christians and the like of that. Um, but beyond that, there's not, there, there, there's no particular, there's no particular method. The basic, the basic idea here, I guess I would say, is just you have to be serious. You have to you have to, for these serious questions, you have to make a really serious, determined effort to wind up with, uh, with the right belief. Okay, well, thanks so much for your presentation and for sitting and talking to me. Um, so let's thank Professor Plantinga. And, then, and, and also him. Yeah. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.